recording now. And um, let's see, I want to welcome everyone to the this next installation of the uh, Friends of the Boston Harbor Islands web lecture series we're calling Zoom Ahoy or Shipping Out East of Boston. Uh, I'm going to put on my screen uh, in just a minute. Uh, but first of all, I want to say thank you so much for for coming out. Uh, I really, I really appreciate that. I really like doing these things. Um, one thing I want to emphasize is this is an exploration. This is something that some of these lectures are things that I'm researching and working on. I'm not, as they say, the sage on the, on the, the sage on the stage. I'm really looking for things. I'd like to get some feedback. And to be quite honest, um, because of my schedule, I'm researching some of the things up until um, the last minute. Let's see, I finished about five o'clock. So, uh, so it may be a little rough, but I think I have some really interesting information here. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll be having another couple of these, at least one more, one or two more. Uh, we had one scheduled for August. We're going to put that off because um, I need time to really prepare on that, that one. Uh, but we will have more. And in the meantime, I encourage you to get out to the islands. Okay, so let me get started by sharing my screen. And getting this going. Okay, so hopefully this will all work. I hope you can see the screen. And um, so welcome to the um, to this lecture series. Uh, just a little introduction. My name is Stephanie Shoro, and I'm the author author of another of, number of books on Boston history. I'm a former journalist. Uh, I'm a freelance writer. I do a lot of different things. I write books, including I've written a book on. Uh, let's see, why isn't this working? Um, the, uh, I wrote a book called East of Boston, Notes from the Harbor Island. And I also helped to coordinate the Friends of the Boston Harbor Island, the 40 year anniversary booklet. So these are things that I got involved with. So what are we going to do today? Well, we're gonna look at two things. We're gonna look at the, what I'm calling the real Shutter Island, um, which may not exist anywhere but in our imagination and the asylums, the healings of the um, of the islands. Because one thing I want to emphasize with this is that in approaching this, we we know the islands. I, I'm sure many of you have been out to the islands. I recognize a lot of you. A lot of people are people who have already gone out there. Maybe some of you haven't been out, haven't gone out for the for, haven't been out there yet. Please get out. Nothing will substitute for actually visiting the islands. But the thing about the islands, the Boston Harbor Islands, is that they've been used for so many things. Uh, prisons, hospitals, camps, um, recreation area, mansions. So what, I'm, what I want to emphasize is that there's often a perception that they're used to hide away people, put them out, like Deer Island, the prison, put the prison out there, or some of the quarantine camps. And that's true, they were used for that, but they're also used as places of healing and of places where things could uh, get better for people. Um, and sometimes both things at the same time. So we're gonna, we're going to talk about that today. So one little note here, this is a historical journey that will connect the dots from Bunkin Island to photos, guidebooks to Tom Brady. Even though Tom Brady is dead to me, I, I still love him, what can I say? Okay. So we're gonna start out with a visit to the Barrage Hospital of Bumpkin Island. And this is a, a trip, this is a, um, a view of Bumpkin Island. I hope many of you have been out there, camped on there, visited it. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. Uh, but I wanna start with a picture of a little girl. Just take a look at her. Look at the face, look at the body. Because this is a story, what we're talking about is really a lot about her, about this little girl. And we'll get back to her in a minute. So starting out with our trip to Bumpkin Island, um, this is what you see or this is what you often see when you land. Uh, you'll find many interesting um, items on the island, such as uh, old buildings that were built uh, for the military use. Um, I think this is the old mess hall. And then you'll find this area. I think the sign is still up there. I'm not sure about the Barrage Children's Hospital. And it's interesting how we call it the Barrage Children's Hospital. I'll explain that in a bit. Uh, but if you look for it, this is what you'll find. Piles of bricks. And more piles of bricks. 
and more piles of bricks, but you'll see some beautiful yellow bricks, which I think will be interesting. So a lot of people will say, okay, what was it? Was this a children's hospital? What was, what was a hospital? Was it a hospital? What was it doing on the island? So indeed, it was a hospital. And in fact, it was called the Barrage Hospital for Crippled Children. Uh, trigger warning, we're gonna, I'm gonna use some words here that we would not use today, but this is what it was used back then. In fact, the Barrage Hospital also called the Hospital for Crippled and Deformed Children. So thank God we've, we've changed from there. But yes, there was indeed a children's hospital that was built there, this is under construction, and it opened up in July of 1902. Here's some pictures from the Globe about that. And you can got it, get a sense of what was there. We're going to dive into these pictures a little bit. First of all, sort of geographic lesson. This, I believe this is a photograph, not an illustration, but you'll notice how the Barrage, uh, Barrage, or Barrage Hospital dominated, dominated the landscape of Bumpkin Island, which had been stripped of, of, of trees and look at it there. Um, and you can get a sense of what was going on in the hospital. Notice the wonderful um, nurses all dressed up and the little, uh, the, the beds and other things. So here's the situation. This, this was built, it was opened in 1902 and it was continued improved upon over the years. Uh, the building was about 170 feet long, 150 feet wide. It was kind of in the shape of an H. Um, it had water from Hingham and its own gas plant its own steam plant there. Um, and there are a couple interesting things about it. For example, in the central part of the, of the building, a reporter wrote this, there were inclining runways, which by long, easy slopes lead from floor to floor without the necessity of climbing stairs or the danger of falling down. In other words, they had ramps, handicap ramps, which of course are very common today, but were very new back then. And they were apparently put on by Mrs. Alice Barrage, who was the wife of the man who built it. I'll tell you more about him and her and him in a bit. But she saw something like that in California. And so she wanted to put it in there. The other thing that's interesting about the hospital is that it was meant to be a place to restore sick children to health. It's not a warehouse. It was meant to make them better because many believe that sea air is a great curative element. And there was a headline about sick children coming here to get well. And here's a description of the walls. The walls of both the wards and the corridors are hung with pictures, each one of which was personally selected by Mr. and Mrs. Barrage for this hospital with no subject of character to give anything but pleasure to the child of whatever race creed or nationality. Now, I think that's the language we use today. And I think that was a little bit unusual back then. Here's another picture of the hospital. Um, and again, there was a lot of coverage of it when it opened up. Um, and you can see there's a picture of Barrage, of Mr. Barrage himself, Burridge. I don't really know how to pronounce it. He was a philanthropist and we're gonna talk about him, but he decided to build it. Now, apparently the the land was owned by Harvard and Raj was a Harvard graduate and he arranged to lease the, uh, the land from Harvard for 100 years or 500 years. I don't know which, I've seen references to both. So either 100 or 500, take your pick. So, um, and it's clear to me also in looking at this particular um, hospital that Mrs. Alice Barrage was played a role in it. The wife played a real role in it. She doesn't get a lot of credit. I don't know much about her, but it's from the clues that you can find, it seemed like she played a role, on, a role in, in helping with this thing. Um, and let's take a look at that little girl again. And she was one of the first patients at the hospital. They call her a cripple. They use words like that. And she had a deformed right leg. And you can kind of tell that. But the idea was that this was a place where people could go, children could go, and they could play. They could play. Play was considered healthy. So that was a place that um, this is where this was built, not as a warehouse, but as a place where people could uh, be cured. Now, 
How long did it stay open? Um, I'm try I've been trying to piece that together. It was open to at least 1904, this place. Uh, and then for some reason it closed down. And I did find a reference in 1908, people saying, why don't they open it up? Why don't they open it up? I think my speculation is that there was a lot of damage being on an island. It was very difficult to keep it up. So it was very hard to keep it up. So it closed for about a dozen years. And then it opened up in uh, 1916 again. Um, there were a couple stories on that. And this is a feature about visitors day at Bumpkin Island. So the so six children were at the hospital um, and you can see them there and then their parents and their siblings would come and visit them. Uh, this, by the way, this hospital is not for, these are not contagious. These are for people with um, physical ailments and other difficulties, but not necessarily contagious things. So at least it was opened up for a few years and then it may have closed, it's a little unclear, but it definitely was open in 1916. But then what happened? War, wow. war, war is not fun. War is not good, but war came. And so um, Bara the, the owner, Baraj, transferred his lease to the US government. And he also transferred in an a, in a act of generosity, his yacht. He owned a 260 foot yacht as called the Aztec, which was considered the, um, he called, it was the papers called it a veritable floating palace, but he, gave that, he, he let the, the uh, yacht be used by the army and he also gave up this facility for uh, army, for excuse me, not army, navy, navy trading things. And that's where it, it were, was during the war. Now, a lot of people think that was the end of the hospital, that it didn't, it wasn't ever used as a hospital again, but indeed it was. As a matter of fact, uh, the reason, and I'm going to tell you something about um, one thing that uh, you may not have noticed. I don't know if you noticed through this, but bumpkin was spelled two different ways. For those of you who are sharp on, some of it was spelled with the P there and some was spelled without the P. And that reflects it. And that's one of the problems when you're researching this and you're going in through archives to have the right spelling. But what, what's interesting is that um, I saw a reference to the, to the, um, to the hospital on the island being open again in 1940 for uh, polio people. I couldn't find anything until I changed my search terms and used the word infantile paralysis because it was not called polio. And indeed, I popped up a lot of clips from, these are all from 1937, 1938. So in that time that they were using the island to treat or to take care of or to give a respite to children with polio. In fact, somebody even said um, here, we wanna put in some hot salt water pools like those at War Springs, Warm Springs, Georgia. And if those are familiar with uh, FDR, that's where FDR went, he had polio. He got it in 1921 and he went there to recover at Warm Springs. He kind of helped the uh, deal with the, with the uh, the place there. I think he helped to, either he built it or he helped to promote it, but a lot, there was a lot of emphasis for this, but then it seemed to die away. I'm not sure why, because polio went out, went on for a while and not to be editorial, but let's just talk about vaccines for a minute. That fact that polio was a really horrible thing. And um, there were many outbreaks in the forties. It got really, really bad. And like I said, this is from 19, the 1930s. I saw FDR got in the 1920s, but um, what happened was that in 1955, 1963, a number of vaccines were developed and polio was essentially eradicated by the 1970s. So you didn't have any more. So, um, um, so vaccine, just a little plug for vaccines in general. Now, Let's talk about Albert Cameron Barrage. He um, was born in 1959, he lived till 1931. Uh, so what do you want to know about him? Uh, first of all, he was very, 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 and I could have said a very, 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 very wealthy, very rich guy. Um, so uh, let me show you some pictures of him. He did go to Harvard, he graduated from Harvard Law School. It's a picture of him from the Harvard yearbook showing him uh, early on and then, and then later in life. 
And this is him. These are some other pictures I gathered from him. He's a very distinguished looking man, very distinguished looking uh, mustache. But um, let, me, let me talk a little bit about him first. So he, um, he enrolled in Harvard in 1879. He graduated summa cum laude, so he was a pretty sharp guy. He went on to the law school. He became the counsel of the Brooklyn Gas Light Company. And he, he earned a huge fee for bringing the, having the company bring its service into Boston. And then he was elected president of the Boston, South Boston, Roxbury, and Dorchester Gas Companies. He was very much involved with the gas countries companies. He also was a member of the Boston City Council in 1892, and he served on the Boston Transit Commission that was responsible for building the Boston subway. So he was involved with the people who built the Green Line. That was the first subway in Boston. Um, I don't have the dates on that, but there's actually a good book out about the development of the, of the subway. So he was very much involved. And, and while he was on the city council, he pushed through an amendment that basically said, if you um, serve on the city council, you can't belong to a political caucus. You have to, you know, basically he was trying to get people away from being political. Um, it was passed, I don't know how long it went in effect because uh, it didn't stay that way very long in Boston. But at the same time, he was doing all this activity, including opening up a hospital for children on the, on the, on the um, the islands. He was also building some fun stuff for himself. And by fun, I mean luxurious. This is his mansion, the Barrage Mansion. It's at 314 Commonwealth Avenue. I bet you passed it a, a dozen times driving around Boston. It was a, inspired by a French chateau. It was, um, it was uh, designed by a very famous architect. Um, it was new, but Back Bay, as you can tell, was kind of new at that time. Uh, but here's the thing, it's still here, there it is. And um, it's actually um, pretty pretty good shape. Um, I was there today because I wanted to run out and get some pictures of it. So I took a look at it today. Here's a picture here and here's a close up of it. And, and I just want to dwell on this because this is the most amazing uh, mansion. And it wasn't his only mansion. He also around this time, he built a mansion in Redlands, California, which he used when the weather was horrible here, he'd go to California because like, who wouldn't? So he has, he has a man, there's another bridge mansion in Redlands, California. And he later built a, an estate or he purchased an estate in Manchester by the sea, which he called Sea Home. And they used it as another uh, summer retreat. So the thing about the Barrage Mansion is that it's on, it's a landmark building. I wrote about this building when I did some work for the Fodor's Travel, the travel company. This was um, some years ago. And I um, uh, wrote about it, but it wasn't until much later that I connected the dots between what I wrote about this place, this mansion here, and what was on Bumpkin Island. Because in later life, Barrage really didn't talk about the hospital. He kind of forgot about it. He went on to other things. In fact, the only quote that I could find that directly was attributed to him was, uh, was ab about the hospital was an opening day. He said the opening day was uh, meant to be very informal. It was only to get the ball rolling. And that's all that I could find about that. So. But this uh, mansion, uh, I think it's worth a visit. It, it has this amazing amount of gargoyles uh, and sculptures on it. For example, according to this website, it has nearly 50 dragons and gargoyles, 30 cherubs, and then lions and eagles and stuff like that. No, I, I, oops, I, did, I, did, I, I did not count them. If someone could turn off their... Um, mute themselves, we got a little feedback here. So, um, but they're just an amazing amount of sculptures there. And you, if you look at it, I spent, I spent about an hour looking at that. And even the front door was um, decorated with this innate thing. So he, um, I don't know if you call this good taste or over the top taste, but this is the same gentleman who poured a lot of money at one point into building this hospital on Bumpkin Island. And then later, 
kind of did other things. It's a little unclear what happened. I don't know, we'd need more research, but it is interesting. So now you're probably saying, did you go in? Did you find out? No, I didn't want to get shot. So no, I didn't go in. But um, thanks to uh, real estate people who are really trying to sell things, here are some pictures from the interior of the mansion. Again, people, if people could mute themselves, that would be really helpful. And so here are some pictures there. And here, um, and apparently one of the owners was Tom Brady, apparently owned a condo in this mansion uh, and he sold it for almost $7 million. Um, so um, no, I didn't go again. I did peek in. I could see, I, I peeked at, at this um, this thing. I could kind of see this from the outside peeking in. And I talked to some people, but um, I didn't want to, I wanted to live, so I didn't try to go in. Uh, but it's a, it's a really amazing thing. So, you know, it's hard to know what to think about um, Baraj at this point. Was he a real entrepreneur? Did he did this great hospital thing? But then he um, also spent a lot of money on himself. It was kind of, I don't, I don't know if you call it self-indulgent, or just what people did in that day, people, what people did, or that the hospital was his wife's task and um, they both went on to other things because, because Raj went on to a really distinguished career. He was the president of the Mass Horticultural Society. He was very, very much, very interested in plants and he was particularly interested in orchids. And this is a, 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 an ad that I pulled it about um, some of the orchids that he put on display. So he was really involved with that. In fact, I found an enormous amount of references to him and orchids and his work. He also collected um, specimens, um, minerals. He was very interested in minerals. He was, he had founded a, um, a copper company at one point. And so he was very involved with that. And all that stuff uh, went to Harvard, by the way, after he left. He did have a lot of it housed in his mansion, but now it's at Harvard. Um, here's a picture I managed to find of one of his orchids um, that um, these, so he spent an incredible amount of money on orchids here. Um, and then later he got into the dye business um, and apparently he didn't do so well. He, apparently he lost a fair amount of his money. Um, and oops, excuse me, let me go back. And he died in 1931 um, and uh, he was it, apparently there was some some question about how how much he was actually worth at this point. Um, the hospital in Bumpkin, unfortunately, uh, was burned down in 1946. Some people say 1945, but this would indicate it was 1946. Here's a picture of it burning, and um, apparently a, it was a grass fire that spread and got onto the mansion. Uh, they were investigating it. It doesn't look like it's arson or anything, but basically that beautiful, beautiful building there burned down. Um, but we still remember the hospital in, in various ways. Um, this is a picture from one of the art encampments. Maybe some of you went to or remember they had what they called an art encampment on uh, Bumpkin Island where people would come out, artists would, did, would do different kinds of art and do all sorts of interesting things. And one of this artists, this is a picture from her website, created a wheelchair out of material that she found on the island. And this was to kind of memorialize the children who were in wheelchairs uh, on the island. So in that art encampment, they paid attention to it. And then, um, oops, and this is in the wrong spot. Anyway, a barrage apparently had a lot of flowers at his funeral which stands to reason. But anyway, um, the um, FB uh, Friends of Boston Harbor also played a role. Uh, these are some pictures from some role enactments that were going on. These are courtesy of, um, I think these are Suzanne Gomarsh got these, uh, gave these to me or we had them there for that project. And I snagged them because they popped up in my search of bumpkin things. So here are a couple of enactments that we're talking about. And Diane really does look like one of those. I love the hat. Don't you love the hat? It really looks like uh, one of the hats on the, um, the nurses there. So these are, these are just ways that we continue to remember it. And again, I want to emphasize that the hospital was not open very long. Um, there was an attempt to really do some good um, there. Uh, it is unfortunate that it, it didn't last, uh, and it's unfortunate that, the, um, that it burned down. But we do have the memories, and we actually do have the Barrage Mansion in 
Boston on Commonwealth Avenue, which if you're into sort of sculptural um, detail, I recommend you go there because it's a hoot. It really is a hoot. Okay, so now we're gonna switch gears and we're gonna go to another place, Shutter Island. Okay, okay, so just go with me here, go with me, here. Shutter Island. Okay, here are some pictures from Shutter Island. Okay, All right. And the eagle eye among you will notice this is not, this is um, Paddock Island. Paddock Island. It is not Long Island or Shutter Island. But here's the deal Shutter Island is based on a book by Dennis Lehane, who you probably know. He does, has done a lot of Mystic, Mystic Rare, he's done a lot of Boston books. And in an interview, um, uh, when the the novel came out, what it was, and the movie was being made, um, he was he was interviewed by some of uh, our journalists, actually someone I know, and this is what he said about the inspiration for his book Shutter Island, which is about an island in the Boston Harbor Islands in 1954 that was used as a mental hospital for the criminally insane. And this is how he referred to it. So he said, this is what he said. There was a minimum security mental institution on an island in Boston Harbor, but it was connected by a bridge. It was called Long Island, but you know, that would have made a really crappy title. I don't think it would have had the same shiver like Long Island, hmm. He remembered being brought out to Boston's Long Island as a kid by his uncle. I believe it had stopped being a mental institution in the 1960s, but then it was a home for the mentally handicapped. And now I think it's a drug rehab place, said Lehane. And he says, he brought us out there during the blizzard of 1978 and it was really barren. Nobody was using it at that point. And he told us that sometimes, usually right about now when the sun goes down, the ghosts of the former patients could be seen in the woods. And then because it's my family, he vanished. That was our sense of humor. And me and my brother walking around the woods and truly thinking we saw people in mental institutions, straight jackets running past us. That image stuck with Lehane and a couple of decades later, he started thinking about the place, wondering what it'd be like if there wasn't a bridge, if there was a mental institution and there was maximum security. I was doing my research. I called the bar, bar the harbor, Island Authority and asked, what's the farthest nautical distance from Boston to one of your islands? And they said, there's one 12 miles out. So I made Shutter Island 13 miles. That's the, the inspiration. He also said that the image came to him in a stream. And this shows you why Dennis Lehane is a really great novelist and not a good historian at all. None of what I read is really the case. This is all a fantasy. How, I don't know, it's not fantasy, it's a misconception. But I will, I have to confess, and this is very embarrassing for me to do this, is that I, I also thought there was a mental hospital out on Long Island, but there wasn't. There wasn't a mental hospital in the islands. There was something similar, but there was not something called the Ashcliff Hospital for the Criminally Insane. But I will tell you this, that there was something called the Boston Lunatic Hospital lunatic hospital until I think they, uh, some guy found that word very offensive. So he said, let's change it to the Boston hospital for the insane. Cause that's so much better. But anyway, the Boston lunatic hospitals often mentioned in the same kind of context as the Long Island school. So what happened on Long Island and it was purchased by the city and they took an old um, hotel, I think, out there, and they opened up an alms house, a place for, they call it alms house, a, a pauper's place, a place for poor people. And so it was poor people. Were they mentally handicapped? Not, not officially, but maybe, but they were, they were used, uh, it was used for to house them. And then they also built a hospital right there with them. So there were, um, there was the hospital and then it was connected to the um there was this there was the pauper's place and there was a hospital out there out in long island the boston lunatic hospital was actually in south boston 
and um, the there was um, something called there was the Austin Farm Asylum that was in West Roxbury, and that also had some inmates from the Boston Lunatic Asylum. So all that is kind of made up, but who cares? It's a lot of fun. And what I want to do right now, I want to let's let's see if we can get this work. I want to actually play you the trailer if I can, from Shutter Island, because it's a hoot to watch. And there's going to be a commercial first. I apologize for that. Let's see if we can get, I, I don't know if this will work. So let me, let me escape here. Let me, let's see if this will work. Wait a minute. Um, we'll try this. If it's not working, you'll have to tell me. So hold on a sec. Hold on. So we can get this to work. And it's not cooperating. Okay. 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 We're sharing the screen. Let's try this again. Now. Okay. Try it. Okay. Now. Um, can you see the movie? It's an ad. Nope, you can't see it. Okay, that's what I thought. All right. So we'll have to do something really quick here. Hold on, guys. We'll 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 get this we'll get this going. So let me just give me a sec. I'll get this going. And let me go to share screen. Let me go here. Give you a briefing about the institution. All I know is the mental. Is everyone seeing it now? But the criminal is insane. Gentlemen, welcome to Shutter Island. You are hereby required to surrender your firearms. We are duly appointed federal marshals. But during your stay, you will obey protocol. Is that understood? Take only the most dangerous, damaged patients. There's no other hospital can manage. These are all violent defenders, right? They've hurt people, murdered them in some cases. In almost all cases, yes. We try to provide them with a measure of calm. Personally, Doctor, I'd have to say screw their sense of calm. <laughs> So this prisoner escapes in the last 24 hours. We don't know how she got out of her room. It's as if she evaporated straight through the walls. We haven't heard the truth once yet, but no one talks like they're scared of something. It's all down, all the lines, even radio. Whatever the hell's going on here, it's bad. We need to ask you some questions, okay? <laughs> Do you know what fear does to the mind? Oh, it it. Rust sick. This is a game. They all have their face. Who did this to you? Or in somewhere? I built something valuable here. I'm not going to give up. Not a fight. But you were looking into them. They were looking into you. Now they have a spot here. Yeah. Let me see your face. Let me see your face now! I won't Wouldn't you agree? When you see a monster, you must stop it. Okay. Now. Did you all jump at that? <laughs> Let me share my screen again. Okay. All right. So scary, horrible, awful place out on an island just makes it scarier. None of that is true, but it's, it's a very powerful image. And I think Dennis Lehane picked up on that when he he thought of Long Island. And, and to me, Long Island, uh, to me, the, the Shutter Island is a kind of combination of one of the Brewsters being way, way out there, you know, 13 miles out, Long Island. And in this case, Pettick, you can, you can, you can kind of see Pettick's Island really clearly here. 
uh, in the backdrop. So uh, it's very interesting. So much of what was put together on this is is um, uh, is special effects. Like I believe, if you look at the, the the center of this, I think you actually can see what. I don't know if this has been wholly created. If they use some of Pedex, I oops, sorry. Times to jump around, and you can really see some of it there, but. Uh, but it's, it's really interesting how they, they use the island as a setting. And this, of course, is the real Long Island. There's a picture taken. Um, and in it, it, too, like all the islands, has this really amazing hospital history. Now, um, not like it's not, wasn't like the crazy place seen in Shutter Island, of course. Uh, it was an almshouse. In other words, it was for poor people. And it was a hospital. And here's a, a picture of it. But looking inside the hospital, we can see that it was not unpleasant. It was, um, had very well st had staffed different people. And again, the idea was that this could be a place perhaps of healing, although I think in this case, there was that sense of separation because it was an alms house. It was something for people out who could not afford it for it to be somewhere else. Now, but at one point in the 1930s, there were children's children's at the hospital, so that would not be perceived as something to put put people away. So, the, the hospital went through many kind of uh, permutations. Um, it was at one point, it was kind of a general hospital. And then at one point it was used, um, wait a minute, let me go back. It was used for consumptives, what they would call tuber tuber tuberculosis patients. And so they were housed there to kind of keep them separate to kind of an isolation. So that was, that was used there. Um, and, um, but again, there was an effort to make things, uh, helpful for people. For example, during the, um, WPA period in the 30s, um, the hospital, I know they call them inmates, interesting, hospital were unable to attend church services in the weather, so they created a tunnel. So there's a picture of, of them trying to, or they, a story about a creation of a tunnel from the hospital to a chapel there, which um, I think indicates there was some effort to uh, not warehouse people, but really serve them. And here's a really interesting story I found from 1922. And this is our friend, Mayor Curley, out on Long Island, um, cheer, bringing cheer to 824 inmates. Now in this case, these were inmates. In other words, these are the inmates of the Long the Hospital in the Almhaus. And then they also brought I believe they brought people over from Deer Island there. So they actually had um, uh, other people there to celebrate Christmas. So the idea was, you know, even Mayor Curley was um, thoughtful enough to go there and help people like that. Now, I, I don't know about, I, I think that uh, we wouldn't, might, might not see that too much today. Certainly not for people who are considered inmates that we'd come and help celebrate with them. But that at that time, there was a feeling um, of trying to help people who were in, uh, were in these um, straits and trying to bring a little cheer to that. So I think that was a very interesting thing. This is an interesting little tidbit, okay. So, um, Walter, I'm sorry Walter's not here because he brought my attention to a a, a primary document, the Supervisor's Day Report from 1938. And it just, you go through it and it tells you what patients were doing and how they're doing and little reports that, and things that were going on. And, um, and, you know, most of it was pretty bland, but this is a great, great little tidbit. So this gentleman, Yafren uh, Alan, I can't pronounce his name, uh, refused treatment. He was very uncooperative and used profane and abusive language about the treatment. Uh, and so they had tried to, they, the, the, he, he demanded that the hospitals, the, that the doctors discharge him. However, he boasted they had very good treatment at Deer Island. 
meaning in the prison. So he was determined to say, you know, you guys, you ain't as good as the prison. That had much better treatment. Now, is this a reflection on the quality of the treatment in Long Island? Maybe, I don't know. I think it's more, perhaps this gentleman um, just was trying to make trouble and I'd uh, like to say things, but it's a, it's a wonderful little tidbit that you can get from uh, the, what goes on there. So there are many, many long, the Long Island Hospital is many, many, many stories. It, it went, um, let me pull out some little facts about it. Um, get my, my notes here, which I don't seem to have. Uh, yeah, but it was basically, um, the hospital, um, basically I mentioned the hospital for consumptives that, that it was opened in 1902. And then uh, William, uh, excuse me, Edward Rose Snow reports there was as many as 1200 inmates and 150 patients in the hospital and the Alms House in the 1920s and 30s. So there's quite, quite a big uh, group of programs. In 1941, they created a treatment program for alcoholics that went on. And then 1921, the Hollams House was converted to a home for unwed mothers. And then they added, uh, in 1928, the city added a shelter for homeless men. And these, these services kind of continued. It was a homeless shelter until very recently because of the destruction of the bridge. Uh, it was used um, as a mental, uh, more, more of a drug treatment place. So Dennis was correct. I think they've used drug treatments. And this has been one of the reasons why um, it's been closed to the public uh, because it has these services. So, they, so basically the idea is to not so much to separate, but to give these people privacy while they're getting treatment. And um, I think uh, it's been very, so I think there's a mythology that grew up around Deer Island that maybe you couldn't get there that often. And so it developed into this place of mystery. However, some changes in that one was Camp Harborview, which was put on by the Menino administration, uh, a camp for children. And this was very much in the spirit of what went on at Bumpkin Island. And there were, in fact, there were trips to Bumpkin Island, even after the hospital closed, it seems like there were trips brought, when children were brought out to the islands because it was considered healthy and happy for them. So again, there was that, that kind of, uh, uh, thought about what the high islands can do. So uh, the island state, the, it was a hospital, it was a chronic disease hospital for a long time. This is actually an ad from 1975 um, looking for people to, to work there. So it went on for, for I kind of unclear exactly when it closed, but it went on for a long time. And it just, it, it, it morphed from a hospital into more of a, a facility for different uh, different people. Also on Long Island, there was a safe house for people who were under witness protection, or at least that's what I'm told. Um, but if I really know, they'd have to kill me or something like that. But there, there was a house out there that was uh, meant for that. Um, and as years went on, like so many things, there was a discussion about what to do with Long Island. And so now we're talking about to the 1980s, before the creation of the park, when the friends were just getting started, when people were just starting to figure out that the islands were a resource. They weren't a place to warehouse people. They weren't a place out there. They were some, something in, in the city. So um, this is a story in which they're trying to consider what to do about the islands. And as you know, um, it, it became part of the park, it did not become a jail, and it did not become a condos. But now I have to tell you, share with you the real horror story of Long Island. Okay, and again, I apologize for getting political here, but when I was doing my research for this presentation, I just found this article that I had clipped uh, back it's from 1996, it's very old. And I, I read it and I thought, wow, this is interesting. But it's a story in the globe that says, Trump pushes Harbor Casino, Casino Marina, Menino won't flatly rule out proposal. 
Here's what it says. Never mind a possible casino on Long Island. How about a casino, a residential development, and a boat marina, marina all on the island? That's apparently what representatives of Donald Trump, the gaming and condo king of New York City and Atlantic City, plan to propose sometime soon to local business and government leaders. Um, and actually, they, they, it, it was a little more serious because there was an attorney, Michael McCormick, an attorney and former city councilor who was recently hired by Trump said, company representatives are crafting a proposal that they hope to bring to city hall that would turn the, a 210 acre parcel on the island into a casino, some private housing and a marina. That to me would be a real horror show uh, because what, what we have now is an island, it has problems, a lot, need to build a bridge, but um, hopefully one day it will be, or be a resource for, for more people uh, out in the, um, in the Boston area. And I think it just underscores the things like Shutter Island, like the movie. And if, if you see the movie, and I'm not gonna spoil the ending, things are not as they seem. Now, there are many other stories of hospitals on the islands. Uh, I'm not gonna go into them. There was rain, there was uh, Rainsford. I had a very famous hospital there. There were quarantine hospitals and Gallops and other areas. I just dwelt, dwelt on these two because I think they represent the kind of uh, differing poles of the way we look at um, putting people who are sick or in, or have a trouble on an island, whether it's to isolate them from the rest of us or in some case to bring them peace or to even to bring them to healing. So um, that concludes my presentation on this. I'm going to stop my share and I'd like to open this up for questions so people can turn on their unmute themselves and let's see if we have some questions. I see some things in the chat. I'll bring them out. So um, here we go. Let's see. Tom Bray was a mansion made into con. Uh, there, I believe um, there are um, orchids. Uh, let's see. I'm going to look at this. Okay. Some, so did Barrage come from money or did he become wealthy on his own? That's a good question. He certainly um, was an enterprising person. He's described as being very enterprising and he did go to Harvard and graduate summa cum laude. So he was pretty smart. Um, he probably had some money in the family. He may have married into money uh, because once he, he, he made a lot of money, they really lived like Brahmins. I mean, they really were part of the elite of the city. Um, so I, I tend to think that they would have had some connections, maybe through his wife to old families. Um, but there's no question he was a very smart, very smart person he was, uh, as a businessman, and he had a wide range of interests. Um, what is the Barrage Manson used for today? Well, actually, uh, actually, when I did my guidebook, which is oh, about 10, 20, about 20 years ago. I don't know, time goes by. Um, it was being used as a clinic. So it was actually a health clinic. It's kind of interesting. So it was used as a clinic and then that closed down and then a private developer bought it and converted it into condos. So it actually has several condos in it. It's not just one big condo. It's there's, as far as I can tell, there's several in it. And Tom Brady owned one of, one of the condos in there. Um, so um, it's, not, uh, it's not for one person, there, there's several people there. Um, I'm sure, uh, Catherine says, did, did, did um, Raj know the Oliver and Blanche James? I bet he did, I'm sure he did. He knew, he was very well connected with the orchids. He probably knew a lot of people in, in the um, city. I did not pursue his orchid. I did not research that a lot. So uh, I didn't get into that. Um, Tom Brady had a condo in the in the mansion, uh, and this is interesting. Catherine's writing. They 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 studied orchids. Yeah, they they um, uh, they Barrage published a book called Barrage on Vegetables or something. I mean, but he may have heard, but that was one that I picked up, and um, he he was very much involved with um, the uh, with the um, with the whole planting the whole plant words. And um, 
Yes, the Boston Lunatic Hospital, I, my references are that it was in South Boston. I could, or it may have been in Quincy too. There's, there's, there's some, it was kind of hard to tease it out. The Austin, the Farm Asylum, yeah, that, that was in West Roxbury. So that was, that was there. And not to be confused with Dropkick Murphy's place, which was a real place for alcoholics to go and dry out. So um, that's another place, but there were a lot of hospitals and they tend to be in, in that time lumped together. So I think that kind of gave rise to this, this kind of feeling that Long Island must have housed uh, lunatics or people, crazy people in some way when, when they, they, they it more housed um, people who were ailing and people who um, were uh, down on their luck, halpers. And they were, they were put in these alm, what they called alm houses. So uh, that's an interesting thing. Um, any other questions or comments on this? We have a few more minutes. We can go over this. When you have a, have a memory they wanna share with um, being either on Bumpkin or on Long Island. How many people like ghost stories? Anyone got a good ghost story they want to share from that? So, uh, but it but it's been interesting. Like I said, I've been I'm researching. Oh, I'm yeah, who was speaking up? Yeah, Hi. yeah, go Hi. ahead, please. Hi, Ross Kikara. Um, actually, I do have a little story about um, uh, Long Island. Uh, years ago, my kids were still young. We lived in Quincy and uh, actually the Marymount. <clears throat> and there was a, you know, I remember going over to Long Island. I knew it was a shelter and also had a hospital. And I remember we brought over uh, like an older TV set. You know, we bought a bigger TV set. So we bought a TV set. I had a lamb coat that I bought and I loved it, but I had to keep repairing it because I must have been, my shoulders were too broad for it. So I ended up, you know, having it fixed and a bunch of clothes and things. We brought her over there. And when we, and it was in July and we left, there was a, a lady in the heat of July was wearing my lamb coat when we left. Oh. So it was a combination of a place for, yes, for people who um, I think were either homeless or needed some medical assistance and so forth. But they were very nice. They were very welcoming. Everybody was very friendly to my children and I. Um, you know, uh, they seemed uh, very happy to, to get TV set and a few other things. So, yeah, that was my experience with it. And wow. actually, when I took sailing lessons, I learned to sail underneath the, the bridge there. So, oh, wow. Um, that was a long, a long, long time ago. Right. <laughs> um, but well, thank you so much. I think the presentation was wonderful. I have been to several of the islands and I've always enjoyed the Boston Island tours. They've just been just so informative and, and just wonderful history. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for saying that. I mean, I will emphasize, hang on. I just want to emphasize, you can go to Bumpkin Island. I don't know what's happening this season. It's kind of, this is a crazy season, but in the future, you can go there, you can camp there. I've camped there a number of times. It's a wonderful place to camp. So, uh, and you can walk around and really um, get the feeling of it. Uh, Francis, did you have a, qu a comment oh. or question? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I did have a comment. Um, my sister actually worked at at Long Island Hospital when she first got out of nursing school back in the uh, early 70s. And at that time, it was uh, a rehab slash chronic care type of a facility mm -hmm. uh, run by uh, DPH. The other thing is that back in the uh, 60s, a lot of the guys in the neighborhood used to drag race on the straightaway of the bridge Ooh. to Long Island. And then the police used to chase them to get them get them out of there but that ended um yeah but like I, that was back in the 60s it's yeah. a little dangerous but um yeah, that that that. <laughs> yeah. well that's interesting yeah that like uh, i think what i yeah. think when i'm doing this is the island thank you very much too things. yeah the islands are used uh by different people in different ways so oh it's 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 it's, it's interesting there so um there anyway i just I have, I have a, mem I have a memory of a uh, bumpkin island. If you want, please share. Yes, please. Okay. Allison, so I grew up in in Hingham, right in Hingham, right on the harbor, um, and we, my father had, we had a sailboat, so we went out there and we went to bumpkin all the time. And this was, this would have been um, in in the late fifties, I think, nineteen fifties, 
And so it wasn't as destroyed as it is now. I mean, there's hardly anything that you can see of the, of the but it was clear. And there was the ruins of the, of the building. I didn't know that it was castle. It certainly didn't look like that. Mm -hmm. And there was the, the brick um, walkways were all still there. Of course, unfortunately, people took a lot of the bricks over time. So that's why there's so few of them left. But um, it was a very different experience on that island than it is now. Um, you know, well, in fact, all of those, we, we also went to the little ones in Hingham Harbor, which yes. are now mostly covered with poison ivy. <laughs> oh. oh, that's too bad. But, um, yeah. And Bumpkin, Bumpkin's got plenty of poison ivy also. But yeah. anyways, that, that, was, that was my memory. Well, Bumpkin is great. I mean, there's a lot of, lot of interesting things in it. Patricia, Barry, do you want to, can you, do you want to add something? How do you get, where do you go to get a boat to go to Bumpkin? Well, when things are normal, which hopefully they'll be by next season, you would basically take a, um, you, could, you could do it two ways. There are ferries that leave from Hingham that will go right out to Bumpkin and Grape. So you can catch a ferry from the Hingham. Or if you're coming from Boston, you can take a ferry to either George's or Spectacle and from there catch uh, a ferry that goes goes among the individual items uh, islands like it will go like i i used to take it from uh there from from i think george's to pedix to bumpkin grape and even would stop at hull and then it would hit go to hingham and then make and then go back so i don't know what's i don't think those ferries are running right now someone can correct me if i'm wrong uh, because of this crazy summer, but but um, in in the future, definitely. Um, where where do you live, Patricia? Do you live in the city or do Quincy? You live, what? Quincy. I oh, live in Quincy. I would, then when they're up and running, you could drive to Hingham. You can park there. I think there's a fee, but you can park there, and then you can take a boat right out to Bumpkin. It's like ten minutes, I think. Um, and it's it's you can walk. It's a beautiful island to walk around. Uh, in and um, see, I haven't been there for a while now, but um, I have camped there, and there were some wonderful camp spots right by the water, um, and uh, just beautiful place at night. And and you can walk around and look at you can look at the, I mean the birch that area that I think it's even more overgrown uh, than those with from the bricks and things. Uh, but there are some interesting. I um, there are a lot of great views on the island. And uh, there's a land bridge that forms to Hull at low tide sometimes. So you can walk almost to Hull and back. Um, so it's, it's, it's- Thank you. And someone's saying, let's see, I'm looking at the, the ferries are not running to the island. So, so great. Um, so well, not great, that's bad, but, but hopefully they will be by next year and we can all go out and enjoy, enjoy the islands. And if they ever do another uh, art encampment, um, I'm gonna have a couple of those on, on that island. Those are really fun. People did some really interesting, dramatic things in using them. It was all kind of light on the earth kind of art installations. Um, and a lot of them really um, represented what was on the island. So, um, so that was great. Um, Excellent. Any other questions or comments? Rob, Rob, Rab. Stephanie, uh, oh, yeah, please go Spectre ahead. Colin George's, Spectre Colin George's are the only islands open right now. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, they're the only islands. Hence, you have me. <laughs> I'm a poor substitute, but um, I do my best. So, uh, yeah. So next year, we can all, we'll all go out to Pump Pumpkin and celebrate, I think. But um but the, the, the thing about these, the islands, and, I, and I'll just tell you, if anybody's interested in the research, is that it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, it's very, it's, you know, you drill down a lot of things like, um, you know, when I, uh, uh, you know, because you can, I can get access to the Globe and other newspapers, I can actually date things a little bit better. And there's a lot of misinformation running around about um, when things opened. And, and there is some ambiguity about it, too. So it can, it, it can be... Um, kind of hard to find. Um, Birch may have, he, there may be some papers, it would be interesting to go in his or his wife's, if they left a diary or anything, diary or anything that talked about, talked about um, this hospital, because I think it was a very interesting project for them. Um, 
And it would be interesting to find out why they left it, why they gave up on it. Um, and because um, after the war, it just never opened up again. And, and why no one else took it. It was, a, it was something people wanted, but no one else stepped forward to open it. If Tom Brady was around, maybe he would have done something, but, but he's dead to me, so I can't talk. Anyway, um, let's see, there's some more um, things in the chat. Um, is the water level rising around the islands? Um, they're changing. I, I can't say for certain if it's rising and maybe someone else has been studying that, but they're definitely, there's definitely a lot of erosion. There's definitely a lot of changes going on. They're not the same as they were even when I went there, started going there 10 years ago. So that's just something that we have to keep in mind. So anyway, it's, it's 730. It's still a little light out. So I, I want to end this unless there's any pressing questions. I really thank you for uh, your attention. Thank it was you. a pleasure to be here. I'm going to um, stop the recording now. So I'm going to say